sit here. Take the throne. You Marcus. take the big, big chair. I'll take ah. the, the, the child seat here. Okay. You can actually right. lie down. The president of Estonia is a tough act to follow. Um, so I, I've been obsessed recently with this idea of, of building organizations and running organizations that last forever. You see a lot of them in, in the Scandinavian countries, in Japan and Italy and some the northern parts. Uh, but in a, in a situation like this, there's a lot to be, um, a lot to learn uh, when you're starting something. There's so many startups here, so many entrepreneurs who may not be thinking about starting something that could, that will endure beyond their lifetime, their children's lifetime, their grandchildren's lifetime. So Marcus, I wanted to start with you because your family got into business uh, 1856. Risto, Nokia, of which you're chairman, began nine years later. Um, both have been through a lot of evolution, war, invasion, depression, re recovery. Um, so I don't even know where to begin. You, first, your, your family's motto is esse non videre, which means to be, not to be seen. So thank you very much for breaking the motto to be with us, <laughs> to be with us here today. Actually, um, well, to seem to be, yeah. <laughs> to see. So what, uh, what, is the, what is the essence of, of, um, of long-term thinking? What is, what is the approach? Uh, how do you know when, it's, when you're in that mode versus short-term thinking? Well, it's a huge subject, of course, so it's very difficult to take one, one single issue. But I, I think that you have to think of businesses as a very, very long-term uh, process and endeavor. Uh, and you have to think about the businesses, uh, when you put on the long-term hat, you have to think about the constant change. The, uh, the readiness to continue to develop the business the whole time and not ever be satisfied with what you have because there is always something coming around the corner that will wake you up. If you, you, know, if you lose the eyes on the ball, that's the most dangerous thing. Happens from time to time. So could you give us any examples of a time when that might have happened? And what no, uh, I mean, you can, you can take, for example, uh, during the... Um, uh, financial crisis uh, in the 90s in Sweden. That was a very difficult uh, situation at the time. And there was a tremendous uh, form of restructuring uh, of the whole banking system. Every bank had to go through restructuring mode uh, to be able to you know, reshape the credit portfolio, the, all the processes, all the way to think about the uh, businesses. So that probably helped Sweden quite a lot during the uh, financial crisis in the late uh, 2007, 8, 9. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more long, longer ago, like, like investing in railroads at the wrong time, Absolutely. or investing in telegraph at the Absolutely. wrong time, building the, the best horse buggy when the automobile was coming along. Oh, you're like right. That. I mean, if you think about the time of the internet as a time similar to the time when the steam engine came and all the railroads. So our bank, uh, our family bank experienced a very, very difficult moment in the 1870s. Uh, because uh, I guess my family always been a little bit of techies, so they put a lot of money behind the uh, engines, uh, the steam engine and, uh, and the railroads. And of course, it did like all markets do, you know, boom, like that. But the interesting thing is that investments into this area, just like now, investments just continued to pour in into uh, probably uh, redefining a lot of businesses. And I believe that what we're seeing today as well. Okay, Risto, you, you grew up in the internet era. I mean, you're a little, well, you're about probably the same age as I am, but F-Secure is one of the first security companies, at least the largest one in the region. Uh, and you, you've seen the changes in technology, the birth of the internet, all that. And I've been on the board of Nokia since 2008, I believe. So you've seen it from its absolute dominance to, to where it is today. Um, Nokia was the company that, I don't know if it invented the pivot, but it's been through many pivots. So how are you looking, how are you talking about on the board about the future, given what's happened in the past and given the company's long tradition of, of change and evolution? During the last three and a half years, Nokia has truly pivoted in, in a way that is deeper than most companies ever witness. Once we complete the two transactions that we are working on now, 
over 99% of our employees, and there will be over 100,000 of them, over 99% of them were not employed by Nokia three years ago. Over 95% of our revenues were not direct Nokia revenues three years ago. Wow. The whole management team, with one exception, is new. The board is new. I have often said that all the atoms have been changed from the company, but the spirit lives on. And that has really been a, a lesson for me during these three years, that as this company has such a long history, there's a sort of a momentum, a gravity behind it. The, the employees know that we have survived many difficult situations, many significant pivots from paper, rubber, cable, TVs, PCs, mobile phones, mapping. We have done a lot of things, and we always figure out the next step. We always do. And that gives you courage. It gives you faith. And that helps you to also innovate, to think out of the box. And the, the pivot that we have been living through has been a wonderful experience. But if everyone is new, if it's the entire, if the DNA is new, but yet the brand is the same, and, it, and they've read the history books, how do you, how do they bring, how does what they bring help or get in the way of this of this legacy? Well, I recommend you all to go to the Nokia booth over there, and you'll see some amazing virtual reality stuff that we have been working on for years and just now bringing out. And, and that's an, a, a great example of a field that will see the biggest successes only in maybe five years from now. And we are at the forefront of this new technology. And there are many other exciting things that are cooking up in the, the back rooms at the moment. And, and that need, that imperative to change the world, to, to innovate, is a wonderful energizing power in the DNA of a company. We can't imagine that we wouldn't try to do something completely new while we also innovate in the everyday business of supplying the best operator networks or communication infrastructure to our customers. Do you think it, people talk about next year and what might happen because the Nokia's non-compete unlocks with Microsoft? Do you think it would be a bad idea to get back into the handset business? Because well, it would be going back into the past, as, as, as attractive as it may be, by a, as a brand? Now, when I was serving as interim CEO of Nokia for eight months after we announced the sale of the handset business, yeah. many of our employees were asking me that, that question. And my answer to them was always that, the handset business has started to become structurally unattractive. There are over, a five, over 500 Android vendors in the world. There's a crowd of people and companies trying to offer a product that has a black screen and a silver rim and acts as a display to a cloud service. What's great about the display business? So if we re-enter, we need to do it in an innovative way, in a disruptive way. We should not go back doing what 500 other companies are already doing, and perhaps doing it in a minor, different way. Marcus, what advice would you have? Uh, well, you know, so I, I, was trying to, I, I was trying to figure out what kind of answer it was, but <laughs> I, I think it was rather diplomatic. It's a, so it's a pretty good answer. I, I <laughs> should probably stay in the middle, just stand in the middle of the coach. That's good. But I, I, I mean, I guess that to a large extent, what you're asking is what guides these companies to survive time and time again. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that a lot has to do with the focus on your customer base and how can you really attract your customers down the line. Sometimes your organization can figure it out. Sometimes your customers can figure it out, pretty much depending on what technology change you're going through. But technology is just one way to make things easier for your customers. And, and uh, to get that true north, so to speak, that you really know where the organization long term has 
as a mission is quite important, I believe, in order to stay uh, in the businesses, uh, even through very rough times and rough periods, uh, both externally and internally. But the mission has to change from time to time, obviously. Absolutely. Uh, but your family's in so many different businesses. It's, you know, there's trading and banking and mining and forestry and healthcare. How, how do you draw lines across them? Where do you must see patterns and, and things? I just wonder what, what yeah. goes through the, your head in these discussions. No, and, and it depends very much. I mean, you can look at the pulp and paper business, for, paper business, for example. I mean, uh, in these past 10 years, uh, paper consumption has gone down that, that way. And at the same time, you see how trees are growing 10 times faster in the southern hemisphere than up here. So it's a dramatic change. And sometimes you just have to go through your structural, complete structural remakings of these companies. That, this is exactly what we're seeing right today. But you have to look at each business by itself. And you really have to try to analyze where you're heading, what possibilities you have, and put some sort of a vision to it, uh, and, and uh, then fight. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a struggle. It's you a just have to think. So uh, it depends very much on the, pis bis the, the, the type of people that you can attract. Right. Because it's all about people. It doesn't matter if you have these uh, incredibly big machines that cost billions uh, of euros to construct and plant. At the end of the day, it's the people that is really the change. So, from our point of view, it's been the, the focus has always been to try to get the best type of people uh, and take this long-term approach with them and, and try to find the long-term goals. Right. For a company to survive disruptive events, I think there are two golden rules. You should focus on two things and two things only. You focus on your products. You need to love your products. The whole top management needs to be deeply involved in understanding the products, how they serve the customers. So products and this other thing is love your customers, understand your customers' needs, and try to minimize everything else. If you spend a lot of time on your service, your product, and your customers, you really can't go too badly wrong. And then you need courage. You need the courage to experiment. You don't want somebody else to experiment in an area that will destroy you. You want to do that yourself. And many companies that have failed have believed in their own superiority, in their own in invincibility, so much that they have forgotten these two basic rules. So, I mean, it's, that sounds almost cliche, like focus on products, focus on customers. What else is there? What, what, what do you find people focusing on that's wrong? Well, you can focus on your share price. You share can price. focus on what the media writes about you. <laughs> you can focus on, on a number of things that are addictive and attractive and perhaps sometimes fun, which will distract you from what really matters. And for also, startups, this is so easy. Yeah, yeah but I, I also think one, one thing we don't talk so much about in these uh, times of very good stock markets and so on is if you want to try to find the route for a sustainable business long term, you have to be having a robust financial position. And, and a very key person in a company is always the chief financial officer. And I've looked at quite a number of upstart businesses and when something goes wrong, you need a safe pair of hands to look after your finances because your ideas might be fantastic, your people might be fantastic, your customers might be fantastic, but you need to have a financial position that helps you to come through the difficulties. You're sp spoken well as a banker. Well, you know. <laughs> So, Risto, you said something very interesting in, in that a few years ago. You said, you're talking about the size, the, how big Nokia became as a percentage of the Finnish economy. You said, anytime you have a, a big duck in a small pond, it's not good for the duck or the pond. Um, and, and I could say the same thing for investor. I mean, the, the, your family is, owns a third of the Swedish stock exchange. So how do you, how do you given that size, maintain modesty, maintain focus, maintain, and, and, and keep, uh, avoid the duck and the pond problem? Well, I, I, 
I, I think that it, when it comes down to that whole question, we, we don't think about it this way. We think about it in each company and how we can support them. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we feel a, a huge amount of responsibility for these companies, the employees, the stockholders, uh, and, and the customers to, to really support them. And then you can't think about building a huge uh, group by itself. You really have to see to that you're trying to do the right thing for each company. And that's what it's all about. Uh, I think that uh, the way the world is moving today, and if, when you think about the Swedish economy, 50% of our GDP is export, which means that for most of the businesses, at least the businesses we're involved with, are to a very large extent outside. You know, they're global by nature, they have 90% of the sales outside, they have two-thirds or 75% of their assets outside of Sweden. So you have to think about it that we are actually quite a small duck in a very, very big pond. And the only way to go forward and stay competitive is innovation. Innovation, innovation, innovation. Right. And that's the beauty of starting a new company in the Nordics, because you have to go outside of the Nordics. You have to become global sooner and learn to, to interact with the different markets and cultures and people. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. So um, just a couple more questions. One, a lot of people uh, ignore the power of luck. And I wonder if you both believe that luck has a big part to play in, in success and business over the long term, or if it's a myth. It certainly helps. <laughs> Did you remember what Napoleon used to say about his, his military leaders? He always wanted to pick lucky people. That was the number one characteristic. But I, I believe in what Jack Nicklaus said when he shot his 18th hole in one and somebody came and patted him on the back on how lucky he is. And he said that, you know, it's funny, I have noticed that the more I practice, the luckier I get. Luckier I get. Yeah. And that's something I truly believe in. We have been hugely lucky as Nokia over the last three years because we have done a, a lot of things that were binary. Either they work or they don't, and sometimes the outcome, if they hadn't worked, would have been really bad, and they always worked. And we have been so lucky, but we have worked so hard to earn that luck. And, and I think that perhaps it's just a, uh, very similar to luck, is the word serendipity. That's a, certainly something I believe in. Which is being in the right place at the right time, I yeah, presume. And uh, getting the answers or the the, the clues that you wouldn't expect right. to come. And it's putting yourself, getting as many swings at the bat or the club, whatever it is, exactly. as, as, as you can. But yeah, the 10,000 hours right. is certainly there. The Chinese, um, Chinese have a wonderful saying about what you said. They say the right time, the right place, and the right people. And I think the, the right people is a good addition to, to this Western Absolutely. saying. So last, last piece of so advice for people in the audience uh, who may be starting a company now. Do you think it's necessary to think long term? I mean, and how long term? Because a lot of people just starting out, raising some money with a co-founder, they can't look beyond the next month or the next week even sometimes. Their, their, their needs are so urgent and their problems are so pressing. And you, you can't avoid that. I think one has to remember that long term is only the addition of many short terms. So, I mean, they compiled a lot of short terms. So, it, to me, um, I, I have the pleasure to work uh, with a, a few very competitive Asian groups. And to me, my experience, uh, which I, I think is very relevant in this thing, is that they are on the ball every day of the week. They're always, always tracking their businesses, challenging their people, and so on. But their vision is very long-term. Their ambition is very, very long-term. And if you can combine that, I think then there's a good chance for success. We still advice for the entrepreneur starting out, the 22-year-old? Well, I, I think you, you need to have a very long-term ambition. When I started F-Secure 27 years ago, my dream was that the company would live forever. It would become such a great place to work for the people that the success would carry on. 
and that was really my, my ambition. But then you work in, in consecutive short-term periods, and, and you pivot and you experiment and you learn. But I think there needs to be an ambition for the long term behind the thinking, just like, like the Wallenberg family is probably the best example in the Nordics of that long term stability. You are there for to stay. Right. Gentlemen, I thank you. So grateful for your time. I appreciate yeah. it. And, and thanks. It's thank great you. to be here. Sure. Fantastic. Fantastic place. <laughs>